So our first speaker isn't really going to talk about propaganda, uh, but we it is. Um, but she also has to rush off um, for an appointment, uh, a visa appointment later. Um, so she might not be around for questions. Uh, but she is Anna Shadrina, uh, Leader Hume Early Career Fellow at CIS. Uh, PhD at Birkbeck, just over the road, looked at women's experience of ageing under Putin in Russia. And her postdoctoral project looks at social and political production um, of ageing of aging in both Belarus and Ukraine. Um, uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have my presentation on, please? Thank you. Uh, so, um, I'll probably start without my yeah, slide. You, you start, uh, no, we'll, we'll see. Um, in my presentation, I want to talk about the marches of pensioners uh, that took place in 2020 during the um, um, the largest anti-authoritarian resistance uh, protest in the um, in Belarusian history. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, the reason why it is important to talk about the marches of pensioners is that before 2020, uh, it was largely considered that uh, the uh, this social group, all the people were considered as the regime's uh, most loyal uh, support based base and it was only in 2020 when uh, all the people took part in a um, political movement uh, as a distinct political subject for the first time. And so uh, in the paper I'm presenting, I ask uh, how it became possible for this group uh, that is most uh, dependent on the uh, paternal state than any other group um, in Belarusian society to engage in open political resistance. And I also wanted to mention that um, this rallies, uh, the marches of pensioners took place amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, despite the widespread assumption of all the people's um, uh, greater susceptibility to the, uh, to, to COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, the, the, this uh, marches uh, were held uh, separately uh, from the major rallies that uh, were held on Sundays, and the marches of pensioners uh, took place on Mondays. For uh, uh, they, they started in October and they ended uh, in December, so they lasted for uh, three months. And um, this, uh, this paper comes from uh, my larger project uh, about aging in Belarus and Ukraine during major uh, emergencies. And in, in, my paper, in this paper, I contribute to research on everyday resistance as a means of political subjectification in Eastern uh, Europe, uh, where more um, conventional channels for political participation are not available. And I uh, look at, um, I analyzed um, publications about all the people's um, problems and interests in five state-run uh, newspaper, Belarusian newspapers, and I interviewed 50 uh, members of uh, the public of pre and pensionable age. And uh, the argument, the theoretical argument that I developed in this paper is that um, to answer my research question, that all the people engage in the anti-authoritarian protest by relying on pre-existing patterns of interaction with the state. And what I mean by this is that um, in order to represent the state as an effective manager, uh, state-run media, the state-run media portray um, uh, the, the state as, as the, the, the main, uh, no, I, I'll start from, from another angle. So the state actually uh, cultivates dependence and vulnerability in all the people. And uh, this is uh, because 
on the one hand, uh, the state needs to be represented as an effective manager and to, to take care of uh, a vulnerable group. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it, and it's, a, it's related to a broader problem. Uh, this older generation uh, was trained for the Soviet planned economy and the state does not invest in um, the transition of this group to, um, to the market economy to be more to, to be uh, equal participants of the market economy and so um, the idea is that uh, this group is basically left to their own devices to deal with societal problems that uh, in the first place caused by the um, state policies so uh, what I find is that uh, all the people in Belarus face uh, systemic marginalization in the job market and urban development and health uh, and public health policies. Um, uh, but uh, they are far from being uh, passive about this uh, marginalization and uh, they routinely uh, exercise everyday resistance. And by exercising this everyday resistance, uh, they acquire uh, collective solidarity and um, cultural competences about uh, the interaction with the state that allowed them to uh, become uh, a distinct political subject um, in 2020. Next slide, please. So I'll briefly uh, speak about the situation in the job market and the strategies of resistance available to all the people. So basically, when we look at uh, the situation in the uh, with jobs for all the people, uh, there's been a slight rise in the uh, pensionable age, but uh, uh, despite the fact that the the, the state um, uh, promotes longer careers, all the people uh, face. Um, um, informal and informal. Um, ageism and uh, uh, the the design of the pension system um, basically discourages individuals from uh, earning a wage, a wage and and uh, an old age pension and, uh, at the same time. And so, uh, because th there's no uh, intergenerational solidarity in this domain. Um, and uh, there's no in, in, uh, solidarity because the majority of the population is on uh, temporary contracts. So the fear of losing a job prevents solidarity, but then there is a, um, a strong expectation that all the people will prioritize looking after their grandchildren than uh, holding um, paid employment. Uh, and uh, the only means for resisting uh, this situation, um, to resist this situation for all the people is uh, turning to uh, cooptation mechanism, cre mechanisms created by the state. So what, what the state does, uh, one of the strategies of the regime to uh, prevent political self-organization to and to uh, control, to, to monitor social discon discontent uh, is, uh, organizing these uh, public public uh, receptions, it, it's uh, uh, these are meetings of officials of various ranks during which uh, they meet with members of the public who bring the uh, everyday grievances. And uh, while uh, the media uh, explain every social problem as 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 an outcome of um, they they never discuss social problems as uh, as an outcome of um, structural factors. They are always framed as uh, individual problems related to individual psychology. Um, and while the uh, the regime uses these meetings to um, kind of um, undermine the efforts of civil society. To, uh, uh, to dismantle the regime. All the people use these channels to uh, solve their everyday problems uh, individually. Next slide, please. 
And pretty much the same happens in the sphere of urban development. I'll, uh, I, I won't uh, dwell here to, to save time, but uh, basically um, media, the, the, the state-run media uh, uh, publish a lot of uh, um, articles about um, the, the activism of all the people in this domain and uh, it concerns uh, many many issues related to urban development but uh, to, to give you a sense of what, what's happening is uh, for example when um, a local administration um, faces a uh, deals with with a choice whether to uh, preserve a green area uh, adjusting to a residential territory or to expand a parking lot they will always prioritize the interest of younger and more affluent um, car owners uh, uh, rather than the interest of all the residents who are not necessarily car owners, but uh, who socialize in these green areas. And again, uh, in this domain, all the people turn to these um, uh, public receptions to articulate their grievances and um, uh, in the in the absence of intergenerational solidarity because of this economic difference between them and um, often uh, more younger citizens. Um, next slide, please. And everything changes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is the moment when intergenerational solidarity emerges in response to controversial um, uh, COVID-19 policies. So Belarus was among the countries that didn't introduce uh, a lockdown in 2020. Uh, and uh, in 2020, the state-run media sent consistently sent mixed messages uh, about the danger of the virus. On the one hand, uh, there were a lot of publications by um, uh, giving voices to medical officials who uh, would advise the, the population about the danger uh, of the virus uh, and recommend uh, anti-COVID measures. But at the same time, as was uh, said in, in the previous panel, um, Lukashenko himself made uh, numerous uh, comments uh, denying the danger of the pandemic. Uh, but... Uh, um, the, the focus of uh, uh, the public health campaign uh, in 2020 in, in the media was on um, rescuing uh, vulnerable, gosh, what, what, oh, okay. <laughs> May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Fire has been reported in the building. This report is being investigated. Please listen for further instructions. Okay, so uh, the, the media uh, focus on rescuing uh, vulnerable and dependent all the citizens and uh, uh, this campaign at some point uh, takes a, sh a, a shape of a moral panic uh, because in this uh, continuous publications all the people are represented as infantile and in need of uh, repeated guidance on their safety and the younger generation is represented as uh, noble volunteers who rescue all the people um, but at the same time, the absence of a clear definition of who all the people were uh, caused uh, or created opportunities to resist this um, uh, marginalizing image. Um, so, uh, so in some publications, people in their 40s and 50s were marked as older. In, others publica in other publications, uh, it, it was people over 60 and 70. And so uh, it was pretty easy because uh, there was no lockdown 
uh, it was legal to uh, proceed with pre-pandemic routines. And so it was pretty easy to um, distance oneself from this uh, uh, disrespectful image of uh, infantile um, older people. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, uh, at, 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 at this period, um, uh, a lot of uh, mutual aid networks emerged in support of um, medical workers and fr uh, other frontline workers. And um, because these networks uh, didn't articulate any political um, statements, the state didn't prevent them from emerging. And uh, as one of my participants explains, uh, civil society took the role of the state in showing that people's lives mattered, uh, and it was in response uh, of um, uh, to um, the the way the uh, state uh, campaign in relation to, in response to uh, COVID nineteen was articulated by Lukashenko. He said, um, "We we didn't close anything." down we we didn't uh, cancel any event we just warned people take care of uh, themselves so the way it sounded to uh, the public was disrespectful and uh, this um, understanding of the the role of the state in uh, protecting the population uh, from the uh, virus uh, caused this intergeneration, so intergenerational solidarity uh, that uh, was a driving force for the uh, following mass protest. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, because the state cultivates this idea of all the people vulnerable and in need of protection, um, the idea, the, the marches of pensioners were designed in response to this rhetoric. As one of my participants uh, explains, um, um, the, the idea was to, um, to, to, stay, to, to, to stop uh, the state violence uh, which was of unprecedented scale uh, in 2020. And because everybody believed that, um, it, it's not that everybody believed uh, that all the people were vulnerable, but uh, because the, the, this narrative was so strong, they, uh, uh, the, the, the organizers of this march has decided that if they put uh, a group of all the people in front of the riot police, right, the riot police would not attempt to, to cause uh, any harm to the group that uh, allegedly enjoys the state's special care. But then when the, uh, the right, uh, uh, nothing stopped the right police uh, and all the people were also um, detained and beaten, uh, the, the marches persisted for, uh, for um, several uh, months and um, the, the main point uh, I, I, I make in this uh, paper is that uh, on the one hand, um, the ability of the, the um, capability of the regime in, in the in, 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 state, in the state-run media to distort the reality is very limited because they can't ignore the major socio-political events um, as people have access to um, digital media and they can observe what is happening uh, from the, uh, in their daily lives. So the, 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 the main instrument that they, the main tool they use is uh, actually framing. But if we use uh, a frame analysis, we can actually use the data from, from the state-run media to understand what, what, is, uh, what kind of social problems are there, who causes these problems. Um, 
And um, uh, based on this analysis, uh, it's clear that the marches of pensioners came as a shock to the state um, that didn't uh, expect this social group to um, to voice uh, their political demands and to be um, politically active despite uh, the many years um, training of uh, their uh, everyday resistance as a, a political support of the state. So uh, to just give you um, an example of how the state uh, frames um, uh, polit uh, various political uh, acts is, uh, for example, uh, when the marches of pension started, um, the, the, there were uh, publications uh, published on uh, a daily basis um, that tried to um, uh, marginalize to, to uh, decrease the, the political pathos of, of this action. And uh, on the one hand, these publications um, portrayed uh, all the people who participated in the marches as um, kind of uh, lonely as, and, and not listened to by their uh, younger relatives, uh, but uh, the fact that uh, these publications uh, uh, were produced on a daily basis also shows, and the effort that the um, uh, state-run media put into discrediting this uh, uh, marches of pensioners shows that um, the, the the participation, the, the role of all the people in in the protest was uh, extremely important, and it caused is a significant wound to the regime. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we haven't heard any further announcements. No. Do you think? Yeah. Good sign, yeah. <laughs> We're not instructed to do anything else. <laughs> right, well, our second speaker is Pip Crawford, uh, a translator for the BBC, journalist and former C student. The title of her presentation is Adaption to the Crisis, and an exposure to state propaganda during the crisis waves of the pandemic, revolution and war in Ukraine, affect the behavior of Belarus and independent media outlets next to and as such. Hi, Kesling, yeah. could you get my slides up, please? Yeah, yeah you can start, you will see the slides in a uh, okay, great. Thank you for that introduction, and um, hello colleagues. Um, so, it's hard to imagine a more hostile place to be a journalist than what in Belarus. After the protests over the August 2020 elections, Luka Krakshenko cracked down on the mass media. Um, anyone who spoke out against the regime was likely to be arrested. Um, and there may be as many as 1,500 political prisoners in Belarus today. Um, despite huge changes, independent journalists are still working. Technology has adapted. Organizations in Poland and Lithuania, other countries, have offered support and journalists have built new bases abroad. Uh, next slide. And the one after that. I'm arguing that in a crisis, uh, independent media develop specialist techniques to combat propaganda. I'm using the events of the last three years to explore how this played out in Belarus. In a polarized media environment like Belarus, it's rare for audiences to see sources outside their existing political perspective. Uh, which Anton Cherikov calls uh, political like mindedness. Crisis disrupts the status quo, which leads people to reevaluate which sources can be trusted. And after a crisis in a dictatorship, credibility of inf official information can go in a variety of ways. Uh, one extreme would be for independent media to successfully convince the audience uh, to engage with their version of the narrative, leading to a tipping point, um, which could lead to media democratization. And under the other extreme, you see a crackdown of state media um, by repression. And so I'm looking at how such a tipping point was almost uh, reached in Belarus, um, but ultimately was not quite successful. Uh, and I'm looking at the response to a series of crisis waves. So I split into three parts, pandemic, revolution, and aftermath, and the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Next slide, please. This is a double case study. I'm looking at Belsat, which is a traditional TV station based in Poland, run by journalists who are in exile from Belarus, and Nikta, um, which is one of the largest telegram channels experienced a big 
spike in usage in 2020. And I wanted to look at how old and new media are responding differently to propaganda, if that is the case, and how they view each other as well. So I used um, interviews with journalists and former journalists from these organizations as research. Next slide, please. Um, the first crisis wave to seriously erode trust in Belarusian government media was arguably the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, as we've discussed, um, Lukashenko had very sort of unscientific suggestions, um, which we broadcast and state media channels like ONT and Belta repeated his claims without really analyzing them, and they used pseudoscientists as talking heads. But even these loyal broadcasters were aware that the argument was not convincing, and if you use archive tools like the Wayback Machine, look at the websites during this period, they are giving more prominence to stories that don't really have anything to do with the pandemic, such as talking about economics. Um, next slide. That is um, TV TVP in Poland. So the Belsat shares the headquarters with Polish state channels. Um, next slide. You can see the jump in subscribers to Belsat's main YouTube channel. Unfortunately, I do not have the cable analytics, but that gives you some idea of the extra interest um, during the pandemic. Um, Belsat were providing the counter narrative to the government, urging people to take care of themselves. Um, but probably the best indicator that people had stopped listening to the government is the fact that the actual virus death statistics are quite low, only 30, 51st from the top in Europe. So people have made their own decisions to self-isolate and wear masks. Uh, so the disconnect between what state media suggests and what's happening on the ground uh, drifting further and further apart. Propaganda tends to be most effective when it tells people what they want to hear, but the state media is offering a reassuring message, but there's nothing to do with reality. Um, so, for example, Lukashenko once started coughing during one of his speeches and announced the virus was coming to me again. So that created a precedent for much more of the population to start looking elsewhere for information. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to comment too much on what Nikta were doing during the pandemic because Telegram had still to take off as a major news source. Um, but there are a few examples of investigative journalism by Nikta during the pandemic. So they used um, presidential administration documents and uh, accused the government of deliberately underreporting COVID cases. But at this point, they didn't quite have the reach of a traditional news outlet or TV station. Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, so that was just, um, you can see that this is, figures are creeping up when there's a big spike, but not till August. And again, so we've reached August 2020, and as you will know, unexpected candidate Zikhanovskaya won the election. Lukashenko ignored the results, claimed he received 80% of the votes, and he cracked down on the many protesters, giving security forces the green light to carry out detentions, beating, and torture. What followed was probably the most coordinated period of opposition media activity in Belarus. The main propaganda narratives during this period were Lukashenko won the election, security forces are not abusing people, and the protesters are dangerous extremists. These narratives were easier to debunk because, as we discussed, state television lost a lot of its credibility during the pandemic. And you could also go outside and see that the violence was being initiated by the security forces and not the other way around. Finally, the regime lost control of the proper Afghanda apparatus as up to 50% of staff were in protest. Next, uh, could, you, could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So um, that was when Nick really took off Sorry, as a the graph. Never mind. There's something happening with uh, um, Zoom. Shall I just continue? Yes, please. Mind. Um, so that was when Nick really had a huge jump in subscribers on a single day in August 2020. Um, the revolution was the crucible for Nick's more radical tactics, um, as the encrypted telegram channels were giving real time information about strikes and protests. Uh, they were criticized for adopting some techniques that were not technically journalism, um, like crowdfunding to encourage Belarusian security personnel to <laughs> quit their jobs without losing their salaries. Um, but journalism or not, this was quite successful. Uh, Nikta also used the de anon strategy, de anonymizing, exposing the identities of security officials. And they gained a certain credibility from the international press, um, ironically. It was the non-traditional media activity that sort of uh, drew the interviews with Financial Times, and BBC, um, etc. Um, during the height of the revolution. Um, is there any luck with yeah, the slides? Yeah, slides? I think there's a Wi-Fi. Uh, wi you see our Wi-Fi is no longer working. I'll try to connect using my phone. Edgy Rose. 
Oh. As long as the building is not burning, yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> um, yeah. Try using my phone. Try use the other and also. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that means that our online participants cannot hear us anymore. I actually know I feel like we're doing like a comedy show now, I'd say. <laughs> I think that it's, I think we're back online just a moment. Okay. Yeah, just on, I will, will take me a moment to share. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we are reconnecting. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I, I'm going to be leaving soon. And if you have any questions to me, please uh, email them to me. Uh, yes. so maybe next one after this. Yeah. Yeah, apologies to the online participants. I've had some issues with the internet. Mm -hmm. This one? Um, Let's continue. Yeah, okay. Um, we also had little contact with Nexta and they claimed to be wary of some of Nexta's tactics, but there was some overlap in the way that they combated propaganda during the revolution, um, such as shared language. Um, both moderate Belsat and more radical Nexta um, are pushing back against um, the use of the term Jumagari, uh, or fighters to describe protesters um, by describing Lukashenko supporters as Lukashisti, as in Lukashenko fascisti. Um, faced with a country in revolt, Lukashenko uses brute force to restore order. Even foreign journalists working for BBC reported being beaten by the police, and journalists from Reuters and Radio Free Europe had their credentials revoked and were expelled from the country. Lukashenko solved the problem of the missing staff at State TV by flying in journalists from Russian State TV channel RT, which may have had some unintended consequences for the regime as we move towards the war in Ukraine. Um, there were some changes to coverage from around September, like references to Belarusia, which has imperial connotations. There's also a sense that Lukashenko remains in Putin's debt for his help maintaining the propaganda arm during the constitutional crisis, which you can see in the tightrope act the Belarusian government are performing in the war, supporting Putin's aggression whilst avoiding direct involvement. Lastly, there were many personal attacks on journalists and their families, arrests, doxing, and confiscation of material. Most famously, there was the hijacking of flight 4978. Next slide. Um, and the one after that. 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 <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to talk about what happened with 4978 in terms of how it affects the credibility of Belarusian independent media, although I'm aware that it's more of a personal story for people who were involved. On May 23rd, 2021, Ryanair flight uh, 4978 Athens Vilnius was diverted to Minsk after a fake bomb threat. Next, their editor in chief, Roman Bogusevich, and his ex girlfriend, Sofia Sapega were arrested on landing, which is a bad customer experience, even by the standards of Ryanair. <laughs> Protasevich then appeared on state television, showing signs of a beating, confessing to organizing mass unrest, and he later began to make pro-regime videos from house arrest. The defection of Protasevich created problems for the inner circle as Nekta had to repair divisions and perform fact checking and distance themselves from the videos before they could continue with reporting. As activism thrives on a binary narrative, the ambiguities around the story weakened Nekta, um, engagement was affected, and the general trend of a decline in Telegram subscribers continued throughout summer 2021. And this is also an example of the regime using a new and extreme tactic to manufacture a crisis and to manipulate the information surrounding it, gaining tactical advantage. Next slide, please. And one, uh, no. I was keeping the most interesting ones, oh. those pictures. Oh, no, you can, you can, I'm just conscious of the time, but you yeah, can go back uh, uh, if you want. Um, yeah, um, when Russia invaded Ukraine um, in February, Belarus was caught in the crossfire um, with the population roughly evenly split in terms of support. 
Officially, the regime supported Russia and there were attacks on Ukraine from Belarusian soil. Um, the independent media supported Ukraine strongly, but devoting up to 75% of the overall coverage of the war. Uh, the journalist I spoke to in Valsat last May described the beginning of the war as follows. Ukraine is now the main story. Before the invasion, we made no more than an hour and a half of coverage a day, and we went up to six hours a day every day, starting at 7 a.m. It wasn't sustainable. We didn't have enough staff. Everyone was burnt out. We introduced our Ukrainian language service, which is unusual even for bilingual countries, as broadcasting in Belarusian only would limit our scope. The shock of the war gave a burst of energy to the TV station, which had been covering the stalled revolution. Belarusian journalists helped Ukrainian journalists who came to work at the HQ in Warsaw when it was too dangerous to be in Ukraine. However, the source acknowledged that the Belarusian state's position had caused problems, and at the beginning of the war, uh, there were many misunderstandings and Ukrainians um, uh, and we're accusing them of being collaborators. Belsat uh, offers also historical coverage via um, one of its um, YouTube channel, um, which um, made videos about the early period of Ukrainian statehood, which offered a counter narrative to the Kremlin's arguments that modern Ukraine is a creation of Russia. Um, there is some data on this slide about the audience demographic in this period. As you can see, small but not insignificant. Um, audience of Ukrainians at 11%. One thing Belsat was quite good at is expanding a language service very quickly to fill a gap created by a foreign crisis. So they did something similar um, during the Kazakh bloody January. Um, um, however, these audiences are not necessarily retained. As I spoke to my source again a few weeks ago, and he reported that Belsat has stopped the Ukrainian language service as the journalists had returned to Ukraine and the team was suffering from burnout which is obviously a problem when covering an ongoing conflict. Um, next slide, please. Since the beginning of the war, Nikta has emphasized the links between anti-government Belarusians and Ukrainians, uh, showing stories such as a Belarusian girl who raised money to send a drone to Ukraine, and images of women dressed as in the protest but carrying the colors of Ukraine. Uh, Telegram's encryption has helped sources to share footage of dangerous activities um, as during the protests. For example, videos are published showing sabotage of railway lines by partisans. However, despite an initial surge in subscribers, uh, they have not managed to recover the record numbers of August 2020 or retain the new users. Um, in the opinion of television journalists, Telegram channels struggled during this period as they were not as institutionalized or stable as a traditional media outlet. Um, and whilst this format worked in their favor during the revolution where they could engage in direct activism, afterwards they began to struggle with competition from larger outlets during the war. Um, the next slide. Yeah, we have a quick look at that. I mean, it's just the format of the external channels and some of the images from the period. Um, and videos. Can we move on. Um, so just a very brief comparison um, with the behavior of the media during other failed or incomplete democratic transitions. Um, there are some comparisons you can make with Belarus. For instance, during Egypt's Arab Spring in 2011, uh, famous talk show hosts expressed doubts over continuing to support the oppressive regime. But this period did not last long, and there was no tipping point towards um, media democracy. By breaking ranks, the TV anchors um, disrupted political like-mindedness um, and whilst the regime anchors in both Belarus and Egypt um, expressed guilt over their roles, undermining the narrative they had previously broadcast, the infrastructure for them to switch sides and support opposition journalists um, who were spreading the counter narrative was not there. So there was the inclination, but not the means. In Belarus, pro Russian journalists restored order, whereas in Egypt, the military coup brought a new autocratic regime to power, and all the media platforms glorified the army and the military. So whilst a constitutional crisis and dictatorship provides an opportunity for media democratization, actually making these changes is a huge and time sensitive challenge. When there is no existing tradition of critical journalism in the country, the problem is even more difficult. And the last slide. During this whistle stop tour, you can see some patterns in the way that independent media outlets have behaved. When crisis peaked, media outlets had more energy. They worked longer hours, subscribers went up, there's technical innovation, outlets work together, there's Western media coverage. There are formal differences between the way Telegram-based outlets and TV stations are run, but ultimately, journalists face many of the same dilemmas. 
But it's also important to look at the periods of stagnation between the pandemic, the revolution and the war, which you could see as crisis drops. During this period, engagement falls, journalists suffer from burnout, and Western media loses interest in the country, making it more difficult for stories to get off the ground. There is also more noticeable factionalism. The intense persecutions and several incidents of people being betrayed by insiders, such as the Black Book Data League, encourage paranoia rather than cooperation. And you could argue that this is another weapon of the regime to drive journalists apart and to exhaust them. So the conclusion that I came to, um, which is still in you know, a work in progress, obviously, um, is that it would take another crisis uh, directly affecting Belarus for independent media to achieve the same levels of popular support as they had in 2020 and to reach a tipping point towards something more democratic and a free press. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Pippa. Um, if our third speaker, Andre, can uh, kindly hold on and Anna not leave. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Actually, I, have I have a question before you go because I um, appreciate that you need to go now. But uh, my uh, question refers to the gender dimension of all the people. Now, I'll explain what I mean. Belarus apparently has one of the largest gaps in uh, life expectancy for, for men and for women, the largest in the world, one of the largest in the world. And, uh, and my, my grandparents, my granddads, they died in their 60s. My, my father died in his 60s, while my, one of my grandmothers is still alive. She's almost 90. So a man died very, very, well, not very young, but relatively young uh, in Belarus. Uh, and uh, have you looked at this aspect? Because also when you looked at protests of older people, it's, these are predominantly uh, female protesters, right? another dimension of female uh, protest. And uh, another question for all you will not have time is uh, the um, ways of, I mean, essentially when people become old in Belarus, they are no longer regarded as valuable members of societies or as the targets, well, not really targets, but important constituencies for policymaking. You gave an example of uh, parking lots. But even if you think about how they can spend their time, there are no clubs. Uh, they can go to churches, but many churches are banned and, and restricted. Uh, and uh, so I'm thinking about my own mother, for example. There's simply no uh, horizontal level organizations. You cannot get organized because the authorities actively suppress it. Uh, and so the first question is, have you looked at the gender dimension? And, and the second one is uh, whether there is some, um, some, at least some organizations are for all the people in which they can engage, uh, uh, given the, you know, the, the political situation in the country. Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, um, there is uh, aging in the Belarus is a gendered uh, problem, and um, when we think of the term pensioner, the the, the term that is most uh, widely used when described this generation, it has a connotation of dependence, social dependence. So, well, it, in 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 English, uh, we have retirees and pensioners, and uh, in Belarusian, there is no uh, such a term as retiree. It's a pensioner, somebody who receives rather than has contributed throughout their life, and receives back. Um, so this is one uh, aspect of how all the people are treated. And uh, another aspect is that another term for all the people is babushki and dedushki. And dedushki is a uh, babuli djaduli. Uh, djaduli is a uh, more uh, rare term because indeed uh, men live uh, men's lives shorter. So when the uh, marches of pensioners started, it, it was women who participated because uh, the, the, the very term of the marches of pensioners was not so fancy. It's, it's about, uh, well, it's what can be even boring than uh, marches of pensioners in the first like um, instance to think about it. But then as my participants told me when the riot police started to attack the attendees, it was men who replaced uh, the women. And um, yeah, the, 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 the women, women started, but men um, uh, stepped in uh, when there was violence involved. Uh, and the second question was about uh, opportunities to, for social engagement. And before 2020, 
there was an industry of um, um, informal education for all the people like uh, informal cl English classes, dance classes, craft workshops, and stuff like that. Uh, and it was very much widespread. This um, type of it, it's not it's not it's uh, it's not about consumption because um, these um, classes were run usually by NGOs and they were funded by external organizations. But in 2020, the most of them were closed, uh, shut down because they, they were funded by um, yeah Westerners. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. You're free to come. Right. Oh, right. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Andre, uh, our final speaker, for um, waiting. waiting. Uh, Andre Calavour, having had an MA in political communication, is now a doctoral student at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. The title of his presentation today is How do the supporters of authoritarian regimes operate political communication campaigns? On the internet and TV. Andre, over to you. Hopefully, you're there. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Professor Wilson, for, for introducing. So, can I share my screen? Yeah. I hope you see uh, my presentation. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the right bottom corner. Right. So let me uh, briefly uh, explain my uh, topic. Uh, how do the supporters of the regime operate political communication campaigns? Uh, it will be mostly focused on Belarus, and by supporters, I mean all people who have access to the media spring narrative and uh, who are who are very close uh, to Lukashenko circle of apparatus. <clears throat> the next uh, like uh, part of my topic is uh, on the strategy and non-effectiveness of fear appeal in Belarus. So it will be um, I will discuss about fear appeal in Belarus and uh, according to uh, psychological related literature, I will um, explain does it it effective or not. So. My content, uh, it's uh, the introduction, first of all, literature review, research question, the theories, and the main content, it's the technology, tricks, discourses, and peer appeal. Uh, briefly, uh, in 2020, according to surveys, we observed uh, the very like um, small trust in the state-run media in Belarus. The same we observe this is a very low trust in uh, state institutions. We have uh, two surveys from uh, 2021 and 2020. It's uh, Zoys from Berlin and Socialytics. According to them, according to researchers, about 65% of Belarusians do not trust the toll or rather do not trust Belarusian mass media. And uh, just 29% of respondents prefer state, uh, state Iran media. So, uh, and Lukashenko at, at the moment recognizes this problem and uh, he told that, uh, I'm quoting, that we lost the battle on the internet. But something changed. So we, uh, for now, we observed a um, small but gradually shifting in uh, trusting in state-run media, at the same in trusting in state institutions. According to uh, two surveys from 2023, 2022, uh, more than 35% of respondents prefer state-run uh, state media. And um, according to Belarusian track of changes, 61% of respondents trust state institutions. And Lukashenko at the moment already, he doesn't speak about losing the battle for the internet. He speaks that we have a right to lose the battle for the minds and hearts of our citizens on print, television, radio, digital battlefields. Some researchers are from MediaQ project, from iSense, uh, me, uh, we 
try to understand what changed, like uh, why people, why uh, trust in this state run media uh, increasing. Uh, media IQ project uh, has uh, good research, just a very relevant act, uh, April from 2023. They, dis they analyzed around um, 2000 texts and um, made a conclusion that uh, on the basis of conspiracy theory, almost any plots are covered by Lukashenko and uh, his circle. Uh, also, Media IQ um, analyzed narratives, and the most used narrative by authority in Belarus are external threats for Belarusians, discreditation of opponents, state is stable, and country in defense. So, I can just join to these uh, findings, and uh, according to my previous findings, uh, disinformation, conspiracy theory are two highly represented manipulative means and the media in Belarus. Also, back to 2020, Lukashenko used crisis strategy as the main uh, pillar of his presidential campaign. So, but we see a lack of literature concerning supporters uh, of Lukashenko and authoritarian regime. So mostly this uh, analysis focus on Lukashenko speeches and uh, a very, very close circle. Uh, but from 2020, uh, a lot of things changed. First of all, uh, his circle uh, and his supporters um, just uh, represented not just by his minister of uh, several propagandists, but uh, broad bloggers, um, comment commentators, some ideologists, etc., etc. So my research question regarding to this lack of literature and uh, this new uh, absurd shifting in trusting uh, sounds like what kind of communication technology, tricks and strategies are used by regime supporters to establish my control. My control is a uh, critical discourse analysis uh, theoretical, belongs to a critical discourse analysis theoretical framework. This concept uh, elaborated by Van Dyke and uh, it means uh, that uh, this mind control of people can be established by controlling all what discourses, uh, but uh, when some condition met, for instance, recipients tend to accept beliefs, knowledge and opinion participants are black to be recipients of the discourse, and there are no visible alternative public discourses. So uh, I moving in just critical discourse analysis framework and it, it were, it's very useful and uh, I didn't find any appropriate um, theoretical framework to analyze the communication strategies of Lukashenko and uh, his supporters. Uh, my methods at content uh, analysis uh, and case study. For content analysis, I use uh, software, Max QDay, and, and uh, critical discourse analysis. Um, so technologies and tricks, uh, what changed? Yeah, we will speak about some changing from 2020. According to Freedom House, uh, yeah, we know that internet in Belarus is absolutely not free. And uh, according to the same uh, Freedom House, the troll farm exists. Uh, but from 2020, 2021, uh, we observe intensification of trolls. So what does it mean? It means that um, we can recognize trolls by uh, keywords. Uh, keywords, uh, for instance, can be like a wise woman. It's, uh, describing of uh, Tikhonovskaya by trolls, a wise woman, house five, and we can find some words like cutlets. So the same is the same from 2021 and 2023. It's a, a new reportage from Deutsche Welle. And you see in Russian that the, the trolls writing the same, but their working is very intensified. Um, what does it mean troll factory? Uh, we know that it's uh, people using a lot of accounts and from these accounts, uh, um, they come and, come and make a comment, they leave a comment under the uh, propaganda movies, uh, YouTube uh, posts and uh, under the democratic forces narratives. Uh, another tricks and very important for my side, uh, in, my, in my opinion, and um, mm -hmm. uh, democratic forces uh, pay attention on this, 
it's a, this, author, uh, this is problems that authoritarian, authoritarian regime blocked access to independent media. And this blood blockage reduces the chances to appear in a Google query. So uh, independent media, you can see uh, uh, this uh, video screen. Uh, I write Lukashenko Belarus and um, just uh, state-run media, uh, in exception of Zerkala, appear in a Google search. So people from Belarus, um, they can read just um, state-run media on the internet. Uh, you see a Deutsche Welle and BBC, but it's uh, like a very um, exceptional cases. Also, it's a uh, very um, known for everybody is that uh, authoritarian, authoritarian regime um, labeled materials for independent uh, journalists as extremists, and it's um, uh, this labeling make people feel insecure when they read or share this um, news. Um, okay, another um, tricks uh, it, it's uh, edit, edit war in uh, Russian Wikipedia. Uh, I'm a participant of this war and um, we try to um, describe events from 2020 in an appropriate uh, way of um, understanding of these uh, events. Uh, for instance, Lukashenko uh, page in Wikipedia, mm, we have a lot of discussions here. And uh, when we changed Lukashenko, on, uh, like uh, we delete uh, his actual post like president, and uh, like in five minutes, you will find uh, that he is a president and according to Wikipedia. So it's called uh, edit, edit war, uh, when uh, editors uh, rewrite other contributions. Uh, discussions why why he is president. We discuss why people uh, still uh, call his president. Uh, we discuss the regime why he's, uh, he is Batka, and uh, the small one is that uh, um, the actual the relevant description of Lukashenko remains, uh, and uh, we have like agreement that he uh, uh, takes the post of president uh, in fact. So not in juridical or juridical ter terms, but an uh, intellectual. Uh, what about discourses? So we uh, we speak about discourses, about forms, so some new changes, uh, and uh, I uh, want to speak about uh, um, some bloggers uh, um, which appear after twenty twenty. For instance, Veronika Mitelska, she is a model. Uh, uh, she has uh, Instagram channel. It's a very um, large and big. Uh, you can see how many subscribers uh, she has. Uh, the same Alexei Golikov. Uh, it's a blogger from um, Brest. Uh, he has a lot of uh, views on his YouTube channel. And uh, the same Pulpero, but Pulpero was already in, in Existed uh, already before 2020. Uh, from a new side, it's a Jolte Slivy uh, Telegram channel. So, uh, these new bloggers, these new influencers, uh, they, um, according to critical discourse analysis, they uh, spread uh, crisis communication, anti Western rhetoric, stigmatize democratic forces. Uh, Mitelska has stories, but uh, for now, uh, she um you you can't see her instagram because it's it's private for now so Matilska had the stories and post uh, with anti-western rhetoric and uh blaming of uh, protesters uh, stigmatized protesters in soviet nazi attention terms golikov uh, it's an interesting case because he replaced um breast um, bloggers kabanov uh, for instance Golikov criticized local authorities, but he legitimized Lukashenko and stigmatizes uh, democratic forces. Uh, this is screen for from his uh, blog, and uh, this is screen from Mitelska post on, on Instagram. Uh, aggressiveness in, increases. Uh, some call this uh, Chechenization, but uh, I try to avoid this term because I think it's not so politically correct. So aggressive, uh, aggressiveness increases. 
and uh, this increasing uh, go goes from uh, new programs such as Budi Dapolina by Igor Tur, uh, Misha Valishnova by Marat Markov, and Tami Prajina by uh, Grigoria Zerion. They disseminate uh, anti West rhetoric uh, uh, and uh, stigmatize uh, opposition in a very aggressive manner. So, CNU screenshot from Tour um, program and from Azeronak program. Um, tour program from the uh, ONT TV channel, and he disseminates uh, conspiracies at the uh, Ministry of International Affairs of Lithuania, um, pay for all of oppositions, and these oppositions try to share this money. Azeronak uh, shows uh, Karpenkov, uh, and Kar Karpenkov demonstrates. Uh, the strength of uh, special forces on YouTube and, and uh, STV TV channel. Uh, yeah, Pokayani videos, uh, they appeared in uh, 2020. Uh, Gubopik, uh, this special police forces, already announced that uh, they stopped to make a post of these Pokayani videos, but regional uh, TV channels, regional uh, YouTube state-run channels uh, still spread uh, these videos. And these video videos make psychological impact on the audience uh, because sometimes they show beaten people and uh, to make people fear. Also, we can uh, observe uh, this institutionalization of discourse uh, for introducing new school, university, ideological lessons and by absolutely controlling the internet by Bell Telecom and Bell Telecom for for now uh, also control monitoring system in Belarus, video monitoring system. Uh, also, it's very important uh, but uh, that some replaced NGOs in Belarus and media, they replaced by Simulacra and the Simulacra also spread, Simulacra also spread um, Lukashenko narratives, uh, for instance, center systematic human rights, uh, they criticize policy of the European states. Also, we have a new media called Tochka. Uh, they try to be a, a political, but uh, they legitimatize, legitimatize Lukashenko. Uh, some eliminated Viki, uh, VK groups uh, were replaced by pro-territorial and pro-Russian ones. For instance, Gomel Sichas. It's, um, uh, it was a channel uh, which supported for protest in 2020, but it was uh, this channel was blocked and um, all audience remained, uh, but uh, admins um, changed. And these admins for now uh, spread um, pro-Russian and pro-Territorian uh, agenda. Okay, so it's very important for me is uh, uh, analyze uh, Lukashenko text by uh, software. I uploaded uh, five principal text. Uh, it's uh, text from 2020, uh, 2022, 2023. Uh, it's text Putin Lukashenko press conference, New Year speech addressed to the people, Lukashenko press conference just uh, for, uh, for his own, and meeting with Silovix just uh, uh, two weeks ago. And uh, you, uh, you see that. Um, According to uh, this analysis, um, we have several quotes. It's stability discourse when Lukashenko um, uh, spread info that Belarus is stable because um, I'm here. A crisis discourse, it's an uh, um, explanation that uh, Belarus uh, met external internal threats. Conspiracy is spreading that uh, NATO and USA uh, intervene in Belarus, intervene in Ukraine, and then try to um, uh, rule the world. Uh, confronted the logicality, it's uh, some aggressive uh, um, answers for Ukrainians, for democratic forces, uh, for the West. Tipping point, it means that um, uh, this crisis can be a war. Uh, and it will be a, um, like a, a, a very serious when you will lose, for instance, when you lost Lukashenko in power. Uh, and you see that uh, crisis discourse and conspiracy uh, won, and Lukashenko spread uh, crisis discourse and conspiracy theor theories 
uh, in uh, all of these text texts, and it's uh, very um, uh, common for him uh, using these uh, means. His supporters. I used uh, five um, text uh, random uh, uh, random text from uh, Azarionak, his lecture, post of Matilska, uh, Gigin YouTube interview, uh, Shpakovsky radio comment, and Solovyov from uh, Russian television, because Russian television also has an impact in Belarus, uh, Solovyov comment on Lukashenko. Uh, they uh, spread conspiracy and uh, stability in uh, most of cases. Uh, they try to avoid some discourse, crisis discourse, uh, but um, they speak about uh, stable Belarusian state because of Lukashenko and um, uh, spread conspira conspiratorial theories about NATO and the USA. So I united all of these um, uh, means by one concept, pure appeal. So fear appeal, it's a very well-known concept in a uh, psychological related literature and, and in political science. It means that fear appeal uh, is a persuasive message uh, uh, which emphasizes the potential danger and harm that will befall individuals if they do not adopt the message or recommendations. Uh, it very um, related to uh, Lukashenko and his supporters uh, communication because uh, uh, if we will uh, if we will restore the communication it will looks like uh, we have a crisis um, outside of Belarus uh, our country is stable uh, we should keep Lukashenko in power and uh, there will be no no tipping point no uh, future crisis in Belarus uh, so yeah uh, they support and Lukashenko are previous recommendations to uh, like uh, be loyal to him um, and uh, some of uh, these um, messages also spread a uh, direct fear of people uh, for instance like Pakriani video so uh, an, after analysis of the psychological related literature literature um, uh, I can make a conclusion that fear appeal is an effective communication strategy to man establish and maintain control of the audience. Uh, but according to the literature, fear appeal should gradually change the content to be persuasive. Uh, we see that Lukashenko mm, didn't change content. The same crisis communication, like from 2020, uh, the same conspirological uh, spreading, but uh, the forms and the new. Uh, Mm, new tricks uh, really introduced, really uh, changed uh, agenda in Belarus. Uh, conclusion, to establish my control of authoritarian regime, uh, supporters uh, use uh, fear appeal, which is considered uh, very effective uh, by a psychological literature. Uh, however, in my opinion, we still need comprehensive research of audience attitudes. So uh, the next research questions is very relevant in my opinion. It uh, sounds like does authoritarian communication really change the federal attitudes or people are just forced to lie low? Um, uh, thank you for your attention. If you have a question, please. I will get to answer. Thank you, Andre. Well, excellent. We have. 50, maybe a little bit more minutes for questions. Uh, Anna uh, invites you to email her. So I guess I should tell you her email, which is generic anyway. a.shadrina at ecl.ac.uk. Um, but for the rest of us, any questions for Kippa and Andre? I can imagine some people might be interested. Oh. Thank you, um, Paul Hansbury. Uh, so a quick question for Pippa. Um, you're talking about propaganda, and then you casually said that uh, Belarus had one of the lowest mortality rates from COVID in Europe. I just wondered what your data sources are for that and how confident you we can be in that claim. Um, I used um, Statistica for that. So it was in 2020, 
uh, in 2022, they were 51st. Um, but I'm aware that there may have been other factors um, involved. For example, I think Nielsen um, did some research and he said that because um, uh, hospitals in um, uh, in Belarus were already geared towards lung diseases, there may have been some cases that were um, um, easier to treat than as a fact, despite the lack of public health measures. Though there were plenty of allegations that COVID deaths were mislabeled. That is true, case. including the um, next investigation. So I, I suppose what I should say is that there is some debate over the veracity of the COVID deaths in that period. But whatever gains in public health were mm. society's gains, not not the state's. Right. Yeah. You have a microphone there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I have it. Okay. What is the second one? Next You're question. You're talking into it. Gene, yeah. has it. Okay, maybe you, you could give it to, to Andrew. Yeah, my, my question is um, actually, well, to people, I have a comment where that um, it, really there were, the support of Ukraine and Russia was roughly the same. Uh, because my impression, I can't remember exactly, was that in Belarus there was no support for the war against Ukraine. Um, uh, the, um, but my question is not about this. Uh, the My question is, um, I was... Um, always surprised that before 2020, uh, state uh, media uh, were not really popular. So if you look at the, the most popular websites, um, uh, then the top, I can't remember, three or even five were not state media. Tutbai was the first one, and then the sort of, and uh, Belta, or I think Belta or, or another uh, state-controlled media was number, I don't know, eight or something like that. Yeah. Ha, ha, has anyone seen, or maybe Andre has seen, uh, post-2020 statistics about what is really popular among Belarusians, where they go to read news on the web? Okay. Before Andre answers that, there's a big difference between popular opinion uh, about whose narrative about the war to believe and participation, Belarusian participation in the war, which is very, very Andre, sorry, question about... Uh, well, people could also talk about yeah, this question. Yeah. So, sorry, could you just narrow down which part you'd like me to answer? And then I'll take it from you. What media are popular in Belarus on, on the web? So what are the most popular media uh, uh, on the Belarusian internet now, or on... Not necessarily Belarusian internet. So essentially, where do Belarusians read their news? Because in the past it was primarily Tutbai and some other independent media. Now it's it's probably different, but maybe you haven't seen any data. Yeah, I think the reason I chose to focus on independent media is because of the difficulty I had um, getting hold of the statistics for Belarusian cable television. So unfortunately, I'm not able to comment um, on that. Um, I'm not talking say, about cable TV. I'm talking no. about websites. Websites. Uh, um, I would need to look at the data. Okay. So you haven't seen the problem. Um, but in terms of um, independent media, um, I'm only able to look at them one at a time. So you can see, you can see Belsa, you can see Nick, you can see other Telegram channels um, and see how they were in and fallen during those periods. Um, but in terms of overall comparison, perhaps Andre would like to take it from there. Andre? Uh, thank you for your question. So uh, as I remember, uh, online or uh, buy is a very famous website in Belarus uh, still uh, right now. Uh, they avoid political topics, uh, but they uh, still write uh, articles about uh, social topics, uh, about economical issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, as I remember from surveys that uh, Zirkola, uh, which replaced uh, to Dubai uh, still uh, uh, popular in Belarus uh, from sort of from uh, if you speak if you're speaking about websites and uh, as I already mentioned that we see uh, some increasing in trust in, uh, in uh, state-run uh, media uh, some of the some of this video is called uh, Tochka uh, by uh, yeah, and uh, according to surveys, as I remember, uh, the relevant surveys uh, that uh, people in Belarus uh, prefer mostly a Russian uh, TV channel than um, Belarusian. Uh, yeah, that's all. But um, mm, please pay attention that it's uh, 
very significant shift in Belarusian media mm -hmm. landscape, and we just uh, uh, don't, don't don't observe like a very um, stable uh, trust in media because it's all times changed right now because blockages, because new media, because uh, arresting of journalists, etc. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Ruta and Carol, please have questions. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the presenters for really for um, inspiring presentations. Um, just to uh, quickly address the um, question about the um, most popular um, uh, news websites in Belarus. I'm pretty sure uh, I, I've checked recently. There was like uh, information on that in Chatham House. I can't recall which ones were ranked the top because that wasn't my purpose of like research. But there is definitely information on that in Chatham House service. Um, yeah. So uh, going to my question. So it's. Um, partially an uh, observation and that uh and it's directed to um both presenters so it 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 will be about lukashenko and covid-19 it always puzzled me um why lukashenko didn't use covid pandemic in a more rational way for his own gains so uh my question would be if you have any thoughts on that if that actually suggests a discord between him and his team, as uh, in your presentations, I believe, um, more specific in, and as it was emphasized, that there was quite a lot of uh, mixed messaging in terms of government and and Lukashenko's very active um, spread of misinformation. So, do you think like there was some kind of discord, uh, and which um, resulted in, of in such an irrational use of pandemic in terms of um, dictatorial uh, context when it could have been used, for instance, to Im impose a very long lo lockdown to ban any public gatherings, et cetera, et cetera. You want to go first? Um, I mean, it's a big question, but I think in my opinion, it was just an issue of overconfidence. Um, as we've seen also with um, the election, Lukashenko was standing for his sixth term. He really didn't think that there was going to be any pushback against him. So because he's used to being a dictator um, when he was putting his point of view across about the pandemic, he didn't really think that there was going to be this amount of resistance to his narrative. Andre? Uh, honestly, I didn't analyze uh, any data of, uh, from pandemic period, uh, from um, which uh, like a period uh, before 2020 political campaigns, uh, uh, and uh, about uh, conspirological uh, Lukashenko dissemination of information. It's a uh, very um, uh, like uh, characterize very characterize him. Um, so just no any comments about this. So this is Vera Hakonova from Edinburgh University speaking. So I have one question for Pepe and one question for Andre. But yeah, first I wanted to make a small remark that I think the Ministry of Health figures on mortality during COVID pandemic were refuted pretty much on the spot yeah. by just the number of black bags and new grave stack in the cemeteries and the figures from certain hospitals on yeah. the day-to-day -day basis. But one question I wanted to ask you, Papa, was uh, you say that the popularity of Mehta started to decrease after the um, landing of Ryanair flight. Yeah. Did you observe like any drops before that? Because um, My impression I, was that the disconnect between the NECTA narrative and oh, the, their audience started slightly before that. But that, could, that could be correct. I mean, if we get the, um, if we get the PowerPoint, if we get a little look at it, we'll see when it, when it really starts to drop off. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think in terms of what I was looking at, I was just looking at you can't exactly pinpoint the peaks and the drops, but there's just a sort of huge surge during the crisis themselves, and then it's last to be. Yeah. 
they did it's it's gradual decline. Um, I just thought it had to mention that particular. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask Andre uh, for your next research question. What is the plan to execute it? Like, do you plan to um, conduct surveys of people? And if so, like, how do you plan to reach out to those who are in Belarus? Or because I assume for them, the fear appeal might have a completely different meaning than for Belarusians who are outside of the direct reach of the regime. Thank you for your question. So the same, the method as uh, Chatham House use, it's online uh, survey or focus group in Vilnius. So we don't have any other options to analyze, uh, um, understand uh, our audience in Belarus, just online, uh, we're well elaborated, very deep, uh, deeply focused uh, survey. I'm planning to, uh, make this survey in September, October. So if someone want, want to join, please. Peter, uh, Rita had a question. Oh. Uh, no, I should believe that I'm Okay, try. Thank you. But I have no question, but remark. Yes, uh, the main feeling in Belarus now is a feeling of fear. A very strong feeling of fear. And many my friends, uh, former colleagues, and so on, they uh, go to internal uh, uh, emigration. They uh, don't uh, see the state TV. They don't reach the official news. But they also don't reach the independent media, like NECTA, like Belsat and no other, others. Uh, why? Because uh, if you read or you have uh, subscribe on which uh, media, it's uh, automatically uh, extremist in uh, Belarusian law and uh, in best uh, deal only a uh, fee or arrest on 10, 15, 20 days and criminal affair. It is uh, this um, decrease in popularity of NECTA, yes, uh, in many times uh, by these reasons. And the uh, second uh, peak of popularity when the war in Ukraine began, da? yes. Uh, but uh, from uh, February of uh, 2022, next Alif almost nothing tell about, tells about uh, Belarusian affairs. And uh, for Belarus, uh, Nechta stayed uh, next channel, another channel, uh, no former Nechta by. And uh, in this channel, we see one, two posts one day, maybe several, several days only without any posts. And uh, one of my main reasons for this situation. Uh, Ruth, did you have um, I'm Kalsberry and uh, from the University of Nottingham. Um, I have a question for Andre, uh, but thank you to all of the panels, uh, all of the panelists, because it was just fascinating, superb panel. Um, so I just uh, probably quite predictable um, in that I'm very interested in what you had to say about um, the trolling of Tsikhanovka as well. Um, and I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that in terms of um, the kind of data coverage in terms of the timing, in terms of any kind of uh, sites that you were looking at or that you plan to look at in particular, and whether um, there, you know, is there any kind of patterns in terms of um, matching on to event activity as well, just trying to get a sense of um, if this is a kind of orchestrated trolling, uh, what are the kinds of events that are particularly targeted to try to sort of um, spread disinformation or to uh, generate propaganda against uh, against Tsikhanovka's uh, activity? So, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for your question. So, according to uh, timing. So, um, since 2015, I observe uh, analyze uh, Lukashenko communication strategies and uh, almost uh, all his um, crisis uh, spreading or crisis communication or a tipping point communication or conspiracy communication. They start from the beginning of political campaigns and on the uh, ending of the political campaigns. Uh, from 2020, we have a very like not usual um, timing or period of this uh, research because, uh, according to my, uh, in my opinion, the political campaign um, still uh, going on, and uh, we see uh, his uh, spring of communication in very intensive manner. For instance, after 2015. The political campaign. Yeah, he stopped to uh, in such uh, intensify manner spread um, crisis communication. Yeah, it, it was very fruitful for him because he spread uh, this uh, image of Ukraine uh, after Crimea annexation of Donbas, but he stopped uh, in the time. Uh, from 2020, he just started and it's uh, going on. According to trolls and um, the targeting uh it's a like very interesting uh case uh just um you can find it in, on facebook on uh, youtube um and um it's a uh, very um, like depends uh from side of um, these channels so uh, if this channel have a good admins it you you didn't find any trolls and it's um uh, for analysis, it's um, um, some kind of uh, obstacle to analyze yeah, the, the message. Uh, for instance, Deutsche Welle, they don't have any good admins, administration of the uh, YouTube channel, and please, you, you can find it. If you, fi uh, you, if you will see Tikhanovska uh, channel, YouTube channels, they're very good um, um, moderated, so yeah, no visible trolls uh, there. And it's the same with honest people at the NGO of, uh, in Warsaw. They also uh, very um, like uh, well moderate uh, their channels. So and it's match with some kind of very important um, events. So they are active when something change or something happened, like Tikhanovska addresses to. Uh, Euro Parliament or uh, Tikhanovska um, um, like uh, announced a conference, a Belarusian conference in Vilnius. Uh, yeah, this period. So, if uh, just I'm sorry if I miss some questions uh, from from your from your side. Mm. Yep. You can just repeat it. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you, Andre. I think we've run out of time. Yeah. Do you want so, to mention your future book on the topic of the yeah. It's not on. Oh, oh well. <laughs> a book called Political Technology, the Globalization of Political Manipulation, uh, which talks about online propaganda and other things, will be published by CUP this year. Actually, the bit on Belarus, I think, is really relevant, because if you look at everything that the Russian imports have done in Belarus since August 2022, it tells you a lot about what the standard Russian playbook is um, recruit online bloggers, including celebrities, um, clone old independent media with uh, pro government substitutes, set up gongos to replace NGOs, and so on. Um, I don't want to be too academic about this, <laughs> but in, in academic terms, it, it's a, a useful way of looking at Russia's playbook as well as what's happening in. Um, Belarus. Uh, but can I ask you to thank Andre and Pippa in a traditional way?